good evening friends <clears throat> our guest speaker this evening is dr cindy newnut from new york she is going to lecture on what's new in itp this webinar is brought to you as usual mumbai hematology group this one is supported by novartis and managed by perfect square i thank mr dinesh lekha and rahul and the team novartis i also thank mr yash kalpesh and the team and the team perfect square executive committee of mumbai hematology group our guest speaker dr cindy newyard all our discussants who are eminent clinical hematologists pediatric or adults and you participants for sparing your saturday evening morning or afternoon we have over 400 registration from 27 countries for this webinar today our discussants from india and they have been displayed here alphabetically i'll briefly very briefly introduce them to you to dr abhilasha sampaga from belgavi dr aditi shah from mumbai dr akshata nayak from mangaluru dr akshaya mandloi from kolkata dr ankit mohite from pune dr ankit kumar papa from surat dr arihant jain from chandigarh dr fahima hasan from lucknow dr kunal goel from mumbai dr gopinathan from lucknow dr malikarjun from bangalore dr nilesh wasekar from nashik dr omkar khankar from mumbai dr pranta chakraborty from kolkata colonel dr rajan kapoor from kolkata dr satish kumar from bangalore dr shilpa gupta from mumbai dr krishna shesagar from mumbai and now to introduce our guest speaker she does not require any introduction during this pandemic of last two two and a half years she has spoken to us number of times and obliged us with and enriched us with the knowledge in this field she was personally here in mumbai and conducted a day long meeting which we enjoyed a lot to complete the formalities she is md mscs associate professor pediatrics section head pediatric hematology at the prestigious columbia university medical center new york she did a fellowship from university of texas southwestern medical center she is expert in benign hematological disorders her areas of research and specialization include immune thrombocytopenia hemostasis thrombosis and sickle cell disease she is involved with the intercontinental cooperative itp study group which is an international study group advancing knowledge regarding the natural history of itp in children and adults she is author of the ash 2019 guidelines for itp i think she is the first author she was past chair of the pediatric itp consortium of north america which is a group of 40 centers conducting studies in the biology of itp as well as the conduct of patient related and international trials she now serves as the co-chair for the interventional sub committee so she is going to brief us on the subject of what's new in itp and following her lecture we are going to have a very exciting q and a session for which we have galaxy of these discussions that i told you and the audience and i request the audience to keep putting their questions in the chat box or the question box so with that i hand over to dr cindy new perfect so i will go ahead let me share my screen pull up my slides and go to there we go can everybody think we're good perfect yes. Yes. So good evening, everyone. It's always such a pleasure and so lovely to um, get a chance to interact with you all. And I really do hope that this is as interactive as all of the previous sessions have been with lots of good time at the end for questions. Um, Dr. Agarwal just asked me if I 
wanted to speak on anything other than ITP in the future. And I have to say, this is always where my heart lies, but um, yes, I'm always happy to come and speak about anything else, but it's really exciting right now um, in the field of immune thrombocytopenia, there is quite a bit going on and I don't want to spoil any surprises for the end, but ASH, uh, the ASH meeting this year, ASH um, actually selected one of the abstracts in ITP for a plenary session. And so I feel like we're finally getting our moment uh, here with a plenary session. So this is really exciting time. So we have a really good understanding of the complex pathophysiology of ITP. And you know, from that very first experiment where Harrington interjected him, injected himself with blood from a patient, our simplest knowledge was that it was a blood disorder. And then we kind of understood, okay, there's these immunoglobulins and these are actually the blood factor that Harrington had identified. And these antibodies were attaching to glycoproteins on the megakaryocyte surface. And then they were encountering FC receptors and undergoing macrophage phagocytosis. And this continued to sort of be our basic understanding of ITP. But it's really advanced. We know that because people have failed splenectomy, there's also a component of phagocytosis that occurs within the liver. We have better understanding now of platelet aging, the role of T cells, T regulatory cells, um, the B cells that are making the antibodies and that complicated interaction there, epitope and epitope development and exposure. And then also again, the appreciation that these antibodies are sort of going in and accelerating megakaryocytes to go into an apoptotic state um, and, and pairing mega, uh, megakaryocytopoiesis, not allowing that increased platelet production that we would think would be compens uh, compensating for the destruction and turnover. So really very complex. Um, and I think this is still kind of an oversimplified schematic if we really get down to what's going on in the biology of ITP. So when we think about what's new, um, What's new isn't always a brand new drug. It may just be a drug that's been around for other reasons that we're just now starting to think if maybe it's an appropriate drug for ITP. Um, you know, this came about with um, 6MP, for example, um, several years ago. I reviewed a paper on 6MP use in ITP. And it wasn't that it was a novel drug, it was just the novel use of that drug in ITP. And actually the uh, title of our review paper of that manuscript was Teaching an Old Dog New Tricks. Because sometimes our old therapies um, used in other conditions may actually be appropriate. So I just like to focus a little bit on two that I think are gaining a little bit of momentum and, and, and interest within the ITP world. That includes our mycophenolate mofflatil or MMF, and then also a little bit of a discussion about the role of potentially sirolimus. So MMF um, inhibits uh, this 5-monophosphate dehydrogenase, and this is required for de novo synthesis of nucleotides. And it's really critical to our T and B cell proliferation. So again, now that we know that T and B cells are really active in ITP, um, and it may not just be as simple as pure B cell lineage. Um, there may be some dysregulation of the Tregs. Perhaps MMF would be a reasonable agent to try. It was first reported for use in about uh, tw um, 2003. And in that setting, it produced about an overall response rate of around 60% with about 25% complete response, but in a very, very limited small number of patients. And since then, again, there's been mostly small case series, but response rates have been pretty consistently around 50%. And it's always important when we look at any new trials, any new data, any new drugs coming out to remember that the patients that are getting enrolled on these trials are really highly refractory. So they've been exposed to lots of other previous therapies. It's very different than if we were to use these therapies either potentially upfront and or as like immediate second line. So I would argue 50% is actually quite good in patients that have failed a lot of other therapies. And it's reasonably efficacious as steroid sparing immunosuppression. And this is a big, movement is to think about as we get new therapies or as we move towards new therapies, can we find steroid sparing therapy? 
I think the the really difficult piece of that um, continues to be that steroids are effective and steroids are cheap. Um, and while steroids don't put everybody into long-term remission, they do put some patients into long-term remission. The cost of these drugs coming out are, are all quite expensive, but perhaps MMF is a reasonably um, reasonable drug in terms of cost and efficacy that it could potentially um, fit into that space. And so as a result, they designed the flight trial, um, and this was a trial really driven by um, investigators in the UK. And the flight trial was looking at first line MMF plus corticosteroids or corticosteroids alone in new patients. So again, first line therapy. So kind of an interesting twist. They didn't jump just to, they felt like there was enough data out there that it was effective in highly refractory patients. There was a hint that maybe we could spare corticosteroids. And I think they did a nice job of meeting in the middle. They used it to see if combined therapy could augment upfront and produce better rates of remission in patients. Um, so they did a multi-center, it was open label, it was randomized um, and it was in adults, anyone over 16 um, who had required at least, who at least required first line therapy. The corticosteroid was not prescribed. Um, so again, patients could either go on prednisone or dexamethasone. It was all at the discretion of the treating physician. And MMF was started at 500 milligrams twice a day for two weeks and then increased to as high as 750 twice a day for two weeks of no side effects. The time uh, primary endpoint was time to treatment failure, which was defined as a platelet count less than 30,000 and the need for second line treatment. I do like this study in that they spent a lot of time also collecting secondary endpoints. So they didn't wanna just focus on the platelet count. They collected a lot of patient related outcomes, um, particularly focused on patient quality of life. And I do appreciate this. We, we do know that looking at the platelet count might only be part of the picture. Um, if we wanna do cost analysis studies, if we wanna look at these drugs comparatively side by side, I think it's really important to have that piece of information. So in terms of ep efficacy, um, there were fewer treatment failures that occurred in patients receiving MMF versus corticosteroids alone. And you can see this, here's our treatment failure graph. So more patients uh, were able to maintain a response when they were in the MMF and glucocortico group versus just glucocorticocord alone. The statistics were 22% versus 44. Patients receiving MMF were also more likely to respond and fewer were refractory. Um, and then a two week response was similar between the two arms. So it didn't seem to give a more rapid response. It just led to a more durable response. And I think that makes sense. Um, inherently, I think that initial response is gonna come from the glucocorticoids, but then um, as we get out further, then perhaps what we're gaining is the benefit of that MMF. There were similar outcomes with regards to bleeding events, uh, rescue treatments, hospital admissions, and treatment adverse events. Interestingly, fatigue and health-related quality of life were a little bit worse in the combination group, but we'll talk about that just a little bit on the next slide. So there's a good signal here. Um, they didn't go out too far um, with follow-up. And so I think it's still yet to be determined if this is really a durable signal. Um, I think people um, who have reviewed this trial have had some thoughts to say, I don't quite think that we should totally readjust our standard of care at this time. And part of the reason is it was a non-blinded trial. Um, this was kind of the intentional trial design, just given the difficulty in conducting a randomized trial of this nature. There was a thought that maybe it was influenced by other autoimmune conditions and a large number of secondary ITP patients that may respond better to MMF. And so MMF has shown good efficacy in the autoimmune sphere um, with Sjogren's disease and other conditions. And so the thought was that perhaps that was a signal. While patients were technically controlled based on whether or not they were primary or secondary during the randomization period, there were a few more patients um, with secondary ITP in one group than the other, and so it was a little imbalanced. There was no inclusion of the number of patients who came off of MMF, so those patients that were not able to continue. 
and or the cumulative dose of corticosteroids. Um, the authors did push back to this uh, criticism in the sense that um, they really um, felt like they controlled for the cumulative dose of corticosteroids in the sense that it was a protocol that was given if they used dexamethasone or prednisone. So while it was up to the treating physician to decide which one, it was really regulated as to how much. That being said, um, it would be nice to know the cumulative dose if one wants to compare this to any sort of historic corticosteroid alone um, paper. But by, by doing a randomized trial, they sort of inherently controlled for this. Another criticism is that MMF was not in the study shown to be corticosteroid sparing, but I guess that's simply just based on the study design. And it wasn't designed to show that it was corticosteroid sparing. That was not the intention of this study. Um, but they weren't able to show that patients were able to come off their steroids faster, that it um, reduced the need um, for an additional pulse of dexamethasone. So they really weren't able to show that, this, that by being on MMF, patients had a different course with their corticosteroids. We also have to be mindful MMF cannot be used in pregnancy. We do get a young, fair number of young women and or women of um, childbearing age. And so this would not be an appropriate therapeutic um, approach for that population. And then combination therapy resulted in this lower quality of life. But it's interesting, um, there was one commentary on this paper and it actually wasn't being critical in a way, um, it was being critical of how they evaluated quality of life um, and the methods used with area under the curve and the fact that it used the SF36 and was actually saying to the authors that they didn't feel as though this was a meaningful difference, that likely the difference they found in quality of life was simply by chance alone. So a lot of people have criticized the study to say, well, you've got this negative impact on quality of life um, and and these, this critique was actually saying that, that that might just be some background noise that we don't even have to worry about. Um, really, the two were quite comparable with patient-related outcomes. So again, um, you know, this is part of a growing field on the adult side of research, looking at how can we really make outcomes better for adults upfront. I think there's two kind of categories of research going on right now. One is how do we make things better upfront so that fewer patients go on to need second line therapy? The other bucket is once they need second line therapy, what's the best second line therapy? Can we offer new agents? And or how do we really tackle those very refractory patients um, that we all kind of know when we see? Um, I just spent time at a two day meeting where amongst a room of experts, um, nobody could really agree on how to define refractory ITP. We all agreed that you know it when you see it, um, you know it when you're experiencing it and trying to treat it, but to definitively define it is a bit tricky. So the next drug is sirolimus. Sirolimus inhibits T cell lymphoproliferation and activation through inhibiting our mTOR pathway. And it also leads to an increase in our T regulatory cells. And so these are our important gatekeeper cells. So the more of those we have, the better off we're gonna be. So this is a small study um, that was out of um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They looked at 30 patients and these patients were not just ITP. They could have any multi-lineage cytopenia. They targeted a goal serolimus level of eight to 12 and the response was greatest in the ALPS patients. So you can see here, they had a large group that had autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. And that's the group shown here. And all of those at some point achieved a complete response. And then also the patients with some degree of secondary ITP or Evans syndrome also responded quite well. They had only a handful that just had ITP. And it seemed to be that maybe the response wasn't as great in just the straightforward ITP group. Um, but again, it was a very small number of those patients that were included. This was a randomized trial. There was a randomized trial of cyclosporin or serolimus in 67 children that just had chronic ITP. Both did very, very well at six months. So slightly different results here where an overall response was seen in 100% of children with both cyclosporin and serolimus with cyclosporin perhaps just getting the count up a little bit faster, just a smidge. And then this was another um, single uh, kind of case series report that was multi-center. 
Uh, this had a few more just very specific ITP patients, so about 19 patients with just ITP. But you can see here a fair number um, over time um, had a um, complete response and or some degree of partial response. A few ended up stopping treatment um, because of no response. So this does actually give, if we look at just color coding, we see a lot of uh, a lot of blue and a lot of green, which is all the positive signal with only a little bit of the no response. And the no response was mostly because people were starting drug and getting ramped up. So I do think that there might be a role for sirolimus. I tend to use sirolimus in my patients that sort of have this immune dysregulation kind of feel to them. Um, I certainly, before I start, when I'm having the kind of second line therapy debate with myself, I think about, is there any other signal? Um, oftentimes I'll screen for primary immune deficiencies. There's um, good genetic panels that can screen. If I get a signal of something that's a little more autoimmune, uh, a little more immune dysregulation, I think sirolimus is actually quite a good medicine. It is well tolerated. I have had several patients um, with refractory ITP that I've put on sirolimus and even not getting into that target range of eight to 12. So even with much lower doses do quite well. And it's interesting, I think, I can't remember if it was the randomized trial or the multi-center trial, they only targeted a level of like four to 15. So much lower. Um, Cause again, I feel like if somebody's having a response in that lower range, um, there's no reason to provide more drug. Um, so starting uh, sirolimus, perhaps targeting eight to 12, but certainly feeling comfortable stopping if we have a lower, um, a lower goal with good effect. So I mentioned that ITP is a complex pathway and you can see here um, that we've now thrown in a few more pieces of the puzzle. Um, we are all very familiar now with the role of the TPORAs. Um, I'm not even sure I consider them what's new um, in ITP anymore. Um, they've kind of become part of our standard second line thought process. Um, we have our IVIG therapies. We have rituximab that targets our B cells. We just talked about MMF and things in that same category include azathioprine and as I mentioned earlier, 6MP. We have our old standby of splenectomy going in and removing this um, phagocytosis. We didn't talk about fostamatinib. Um, I do feel as though fostamatinib is um, not really new um, anymore in the sense that a lot of the, the primary trial data is, is out. Um, and at least in the United States, it's gained FDA approval as a second line therapy in adults, um, but fostamatinib is essentially is a sick inhibitor. It prevents the conformational change that macrophages have to do in order to engulf uh, an antibody coated platelet. And so it's been very um, considered very successful therapy when particularly used as really more upfront second line therapy, um, not as much so in really refractory patients. And I think the downside of the study was that the durable response was only about 20%. Um, again, taking into account a very, very highly re refractory group of patients. The other downside of fostamatinib is that it, it, in talking to adult colleagues that use it with fair, um, fair frequency, it's not that well tolerated. Um, it has two pretty significant adverse effects in terms of diarrhea, which can be quite life impacting, health related quality of life impacting, as well as hypertension. And both have led to discontinuation of drugs of drug um, in the clinical trials as well. But I'd like to highlight a few things that are new. So with regards to antibodies, we have FCRN uh, inhibitors. We are getting new data on the role of um, BTK inhibitors, and then also the role of complement and direct complement um, platelet uh, lysis. So these are our emerging therapies. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some anti-CD8 therapy um, of which there's trials in design, but no data yet. So FCRN receptor, I think is one of my favorite new therapies just because I think it's pretty cool in how it's working because we really do know exactly what it's doing. And, and we don't always know that with some of these other immune targets um, and new therapies in terms of immune targets, but this is pretty specific. So what these drugs are doing, 
is that we learned, we know that IgG um, gets recycled. So it comes in and it gets recycled and it has to bind to the FCRN um, in order to be um, spared from degradation. So FCRN bound um, immunoglobulin gets brought back up to the surface and it gets released. If it's unbound, then it gets degraded. So what happens is in this new strategy is there's, an F, there's a blocker of the FCRN. So that's here in green. So if now our FCRN sites are all bound up, uh, more of our pathogenic IgG for ITP is unbound and a greater amount will get broken down with very little actually getting recycled up to the surface. So pretty cool proof of concept. Um, the first one I'll talk about is um, uh, Roxana uh, Lixumab. I've told them they need to make these names easier to pronounce, um, but this is a sub-Q infusion um, and they have done a phase two study of multiple doses, trying to find the right dose. It was a sub-Q infusion every one or two weeks, depending upon which um, arm people were in. So some were single dose um, and some were getting um, two separate doses, but they did four, seven, 10, 15, and 20. It did look like the single 15 was the more effective dose. Um, but again, here almost 50% of patients, anywhere from 10 to 20 milligrams per kilogram showed a very good response. Um, there were a few um, adverse event, uh, events in patients, but they were all mild to moderate. The most common was a bit of a headache. Um, I don't know if this is somehow a signal again, because we know IVIG can give us headaches. Um, and that was reported in 40% of patients. There were 15 um, that were felt to be treatment related, no drug related, serious adverse events, and no AEs that required anybody to come off the study. This is really nice because it's sub-Q. So, um, you know, if we could get patients something, I, I have a lot of teenagers and I can tell you the biggest struggle is daily medicines. Um, so perhaps even if this is, again, an ongoing drug similar to Remipolstum, for example, where we have to give it weekly, that may still be better for some patients, um, particularly if it could be sub-Q. So I think this is exciting in that sense, um, even if it does require some degree of ongoing therapy. They do not have long-term kind of extended data yet on these drugs to know what happens over time. This is again, that proof of principle. So they just showed that again, the IgG levels went down as the platelet count went up. So pretty nice um, design. I think, again, we just need to know what happens. You know, we can see that over time we start to rebuild up and the platelet count comes back down. So exactly how frequently patients would need these drugs. Um, can you lose the response over time? And is there a safety signal that's there over time that wasn't there in the initial studies? Um, time will tell. Uh, the other one is efkertigamod. Um, this just shows the study showing uh, placebo versus our five or a 10 dose. Um, these were IV weekly um, shown here. Again, good response rates um, with weekly IV infusions, um, 46, almost 50% again, um, and about 40% for a durable response. Um, again, not long-term studies yet, so how this will be given, I don't know. And, and how we pair an IV infusion versus sub-Q, I think will really come down to how frequently patients need it, how durable the response is and the side effect profile. So two exciting drugs in the pipeline. Um, I guess we'll see who comes to the finish line first. Um, this is BTK inhibition. So BTK we know does a number of things. Um, it blocks our FC gamma mediated macrophage destruction. It blocks signaling through our B cells and it's engineered to have less of the platelet function effect. And so this is really critical. Um, so we want all these good effects, right? We want all of the pathophysiology of um, fixing the ITP with a BTK, what we don't want is the negative effects where it's been known to affect platelet aggregation. And because of how this drug was engineered, it actually does not have that effect on platelet function. So it's really good um, that we now have a BTK that we can use 
in ITP patients and not worry that we're also giving them a platelet dysfunction at the same time and making things worse. And this just shows um, the aggregation studies um, showing that it, it basically does not have any inhibition um, compared to other uh, BTKs. So this is um, a brutinib, and then you can see with the um, rilzabrutinib, no change um, in healthy volunteers or in patients with ITP. So again, very exciting to be able to now use these as a class of drugs. This is the data on 400 milligrams given twice daily. Um, they had 60 patients enrolled, 40%. Um, so we're seeing a theme here. Most of these drugs are gonna hit at least short term, about a 40 to 50%. Um, of a degree of response. What I think is pretty cool about Rilzabrutinib is that the time to response was pretty quick. It took about 11.5 days, so say 12 days or so. Probably the average is gonna be around 10 to 14. But perhaps this is a good drug um, if it really can, can work that quickly and give us a maintenance therapy that doesn't take months to ramp up. Um, and of the responders, they spent about 65% of the weeks um, in, in a good uh, response. This also shows the breakdown they looked at if the response varied by any particular subgroup of ITP in terms of duration of ITP, um, other therapies, splenectomy or not. And they didn't really find any difference. Again, it was a pretty consistent response around 40%. Um, this shows side effects down here, um, treatment related diarrhea, nausea, and fatigue, um, not very um, significant, all grade one or grade two. And this is just showing the graph of those patients in the total population, um, but those um, that actually hit the 400 milligrams. So they actually ratcheted up the dose, um, but once they got to 400, they got nice and steady. And you can see that a lot of the population stayed right at about um, or above uh, that platelet count threshold. So it was, it's good to see, again, this is gonna be a different type of therapy. This is a daily ongoing therapy compared to the FCRNs, which are a little bit more um, uh, episodic. So the complement story has been a great one. Um, this has come a lot of work out of the Boston group looking at complement levels and realizing that there is some degree of complement impairment in a number of patients with ITP. And so what they did was there's a targeted drug now against the C1 complex called sutimlimab. And they chose a C1 classical pathway because really that would minimize side effects. So they tried to do, they tried to do this in a way that avoided all the other important pathways to minimize the effects on the immune system and the risk for severe infections. So this is really a more targeted drug for the component of complement that is um, creating the immediate um, uh, platelet effect. Um, so it is a, a monoclonal antibody. It's directed against C1S. This is a very, very small number of patients, but again, response rate of around 40%, complete response rate in 33, but with such small numbers, a little hard to tell. You can see here though, they looked at um, functional assays and they do tend to trend again with the platelet count. So I think it's good to also see that studies are not only showing us the drug did something um, in terms of the platelet count, but they're also showing the biologic plausibility. They're also showing that the anticipated biologic effect of the drug relates to that change in platelet count. Again, these are gonna be ongoing therapies. Um, so uh, something that we need to be mindful of, but you can see they work rather quickly. So again, quite a quick response good to see compared to sometimes when we're starting second line therapy and waiting quite some time to see a good effect. So lastly, I'll end just with the CD38 story. story. So this is daratuzumab um, and um, one other one, the mega, um, uh, <laughs> get a map. Um, these are both, um, CD38, and um, CD38 is really an important marker of our immune system. Um, there are case series of using daratubumab in very refractory post-transplant setting. Um, this is where this has mostly been used. Um, we've also used bortuzumab in this setting. Um, and there is, a stat, there is a trial in ITP that is ongoing. Um, and same thing with this, there is a trial in ITP. So people are conducting these trials 
I think right now it's sort of limited to case reports. I think it'll be interesting. I think we should still develop these drugs. I think we are still going to need something for highly refractory patients. I do think that where these drugs are going to fall out with such, with such a higher kind of immune hit compared to the therapies we just talked about is going to be challenging. Um, you know, which patients are we going to select um, the more global kind of CD38 and, and the, the sort of risk profile associated with doing that compared to these other therapies? I would argue these drugs likely still have that role in the very refractory patients. I do use them in the post-transplant setting. I think we know in that setting that just continuing to put Band-Aids on the situation isn't gonna make it better. This is a true, these are post-transplant true immune dysregulation where there has been a proliferation of a population of a cell that is misbehaving and we need something to truly shut it down. Um, but I think that's different than the average patient that has ITP. So the next step, um, and I'll pause, and this is just a little of my philosophic, but we were discussing at this meeting is really the next step of where we need to take ITP. And nobody has the answers yet, um, but if we're talking about sort of where is ITP going, I think it's, we are really trying to nail down tailored therapy. What panel, what can we look at? Can we look at markers of um, what, what part of the immune system is the driver? What cells, what is it that's over proliferating? Um, which patients have the complement signal? How can we work on that? Um, there's great biology that's matching all of this, really trying to figure out how can we get the biology into clinical practice? And it's, you know, it's challenging because we go to these meetings and there's so much smart science on the biology side, but we've really yet to integrate that into our clinical practice. And I think that's why the crosstalk is so good. That's why it's so great to get people like me that are much more clinical um, and clinical research based and understand the new therapies. And then you get wonderful minds like John Semple and, and people doing true platelet immunology contributing to the discussion. And, and hopefully at some point the two will merge. I had a lovely conversation with David Cooter at a meeting and we were discussing, I said, you know, is it ever possible to get to corticosteroid, ster corticosteroid sparing therapy for adults? They all hate it. It's, it's a miserable therapy despite being inexpensive. Um, and his vision is yes, um, but maybe not with combination therapy, but if these new drugs can come out and, and really show that they're well tolerated, if, if we can make them affordable, um, then perhaps that is where we would go. Um, and, and even the next step would be to know a diagnosis, sort of which drug a particular patient might do better with. So I think there's a lot um, that is making the field very exciting um, at this present time. And I really enjoy the crosstalk that's occurring in terms of how do we put this whole picture together? And, and we all know it, it doesn't take um, taking care of a lot of patients with ITP to appreciate how diverse and different and heterogeneous they are and how different it is than one simple kind of protocol that matches all of our patients. Um, I did wanna highlight, I went through and just kind of glanced at the ASH abstract meetings. Um, if any of you are attending in person, um, but if you're not um, even attending virtually or going on the website and just looking at these, these are some that sort of just hit my radar that I wanted to take a peek at for different reasons. Um, so this is again, upfront therapy. Um, of l thrombopag and um, rituximab. So again, some work in that area of combination therapy with the TPOs. So can we take a TPO, increase platelet production while at the same time hitting the signal of the immune system and get some kind of immune modulation? There will be some more data on um, rosibutinib in terms of clinical predictors of response to rosibutinib. Um, so this microbleed, um, this is work being done by Nicola Cooper in the UK. Um, and she's done studies showing that at least in adults, um, 
there are some adults that have these micro bleeds um, on imaging. So they never presented with an overt hemorrhage, but they have these little signals of micro bleeds. And the question is, in, in older populations, those may just be a natural phenomenon and a natural occurrence. So then she also started to look at the pediatric population. So I'm interested to see what that signal is. I guess I'm also a little bit afraid because if we learn that children are having microbleeds, I don't know what that means in terms of what we need to do for our treatment, but I'm interested to see. Um, there will be, here is the plenary session. Um, again, super excited to see ITP hit the plenary stage. Um, and this is on the FGAR mod. So this is on that other FCR, one of the FCRN receptor um, inhibitors. This is a nice study. I've seen her present some of the data on this. This is long-term outcomes of adolescents and young adults. So I think the population that has been overlooked for a long, long time, I always say, if you come to my center and you get off, if you're 19 years old and you happen to get assigned to me, you're gonna get off on the seventh floor and you're gonna get completely different treatment than if you go two floors above and go to the adult hemonc center and get treated there. So this study is really addressing that. How do we close gaps in this kind of bridge population? The other one is inborn errors of immunity. I think this is a rather small study, but I wanted to put it on here for the concept of, again, the biology, the importance of understanding are refractory ITP patients truly ITP patients, or is there something else? Is there a different driver? Looking for immune dysregulation um, is something that a lot of us are really interested in, and we're learning quite a bit. And then the last one, if I can move my, I can only see my bar at the moment. Um, so the last one is oh, just more data on l thrombopag. And I thought this was important because it's just more interim analysis and long-term data. So um, giving us a little bit more information. Um, again, here is um, multi-lineage, multi-refractory ITP. Um, and I just like anything that comes out of the France registry. They are um, really organized and really put out nice data. Um, and this is two studies. I thought this was interesting. There's two abstracts on cognitive impairment. And if we loop that back into the microbleed story, um, kind of interesting. So I'm kind of interested to see um, what these two um, abstracts will say. Um, and then this is um, a, a study assessing the uh, rameplastin in newly diagnosed patients. Um, so again, how else can we use these drugs? Avathrombopag, this is sort of the newest TPO to hit the stage and it's real world data. I always love when people publish real world data. And then these last two um, I put in here because this was our previous conversation. Um, there is one using Ramiplastin for pediatric solid tumors. So we had talked a little bit before in one of our previous discussions about chemotherapy induced. And then this is um, use after stem cell transplant. So management of um, thrombocytopenia after transplant. So lots of good stuff coming up at the meeting. That was just the selected abstracts that were of interest to me out of about, I don't know, probably 30 pages of things when you just search um, immune thrombocytopenia. But so I would argue we still have significant knowledge gaps, but we have many novel therapeutics on the way. Um, but there's still always going to be those refractory patients. And I think we, there, I, I don't know that we'll ever have too many agents for ITP, um, particularly as we start to individualize it more and maybe really tease out these differences. Um, I think it's, it's really exciting. And, um, you know, I, I truly think the more the merrier in terms of therapies for these patients. So I will pause there. I know there's always so much wonderful discussion. Um, I'm actually going to stop my screen share so I can see everybody's wonderful faces much better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nianet, for bringing us on par with what's happening in the world. And it's very exciting, the abstracts that you gave the titles of, which are coming up in ASH. And I'm sure that that will make a big impact in knowledge and maybe in practice. So those of you who are willing to open your videos, please, you can open your videos. We can see each other. And uh, questions, you can put the raise hand sign. We'll use that for uh, having the questions in the order. Aditi, come on, start. Thank you, ma'am. It was a very exciting talk. So, uh, ma'am, my first question is, we have a patient with APLA syndrome, bad obstetric history, two previous spontaneous abortion with ITP, steroid non-responder and partial response to MMF. 
platelets staying about 50 to 60000 now she wants to conceive again so what would you suggest as a treatment plan should be a oh, very interesting and timely question i actually just went through this um with one of my young young patients that was is highly refractory um and wish to get pregnant um I, in asking around, got a couple different thoughts on this. Um, and, and I do think that hopefully the, the young adolescent cohort is gonna give us a little bit of knowledge about this. One option is, and one I would make sure with multiple miscarriages screening for antiphospholipid antibodies. Um, she's, in a, in a, she's positive, ma'am. She is a known yeah. APLA syndrome. Yeah, so, so I think, um, I think one thing I did, so I tried with um, one of my, we did, um, there's some discussion about low dose rituximab. So if you use not the 375 per meter square, but just hundred weekly. So the Zaha protocol um, that may give you as good of an effect, um, but it may also let you um, not have the long lasting effect on the fetus. So the, the concern with the 375 is that they really recommend delaying pregnancy six months to a year because of leukopenia, severe leukopenia in the infant. With the 100 milligrams weekly, it's not enough to really build up. And by the time a woman gets pregnant and has her child, the drug will not be cumulative enough to cause that leukopenia. So that's one option is trying the rituximab low dose. The other is to try something like an IVIG or something to bridge the first trimester. And then there is a thought that the TPOs may be effective in second and third trimester without um, danger to the fetus. Um, there's a small amount of data by Mark Michelle that's come out on this. Um, so again, if you can bridge with something else. And then azathioprine is the immunosuppressant agent that we kind of accept to be safe in pregnancy. I'm in cases of APLA syndrome, should we give TPO agonist? Yeah, so this came up as well. It was actually, I was just at another meeting and it was, I was so shocked that there was actually debate around whether or not TPOs cause thrombosis. And there's a lot of people that say, I don't really believe it. Um, so I think it's always weighing risks and benefits. Um, you know, if you can get her on the TPO such that then you could put her on a low dose of some degree of anticoagulation to kind of get her through the pregnancy with the antiphospholipids and getting, you know, trying to avoid miscase, right? So we have two things that we need to treat. One is, you know, they counteract each other. So if you can put her on a TPO, get the platelet count up, then perhaps you could then provide that amount of anticoagulation to prevent the miscarriage from the antiphospholipids and mitigate any risk then of thrombosis from the TPO. Right. Um, I, I, but I, you know, the the rituximab is an interesting, um, and I and I did try that with my patient. I I was not quite yet at the place of wanting to put her, and she had been on just single agent TPO before with no response. You could also try. Um, what um, Terry Gersheimer, who I um, really respect as having good knowledge in the field of pregnancy and ITP. Um, again, if you can bridge to that first trimester, azathioprine, um, some degree of combination of TPOs and azathioprine, even if they haven't responded to one or the other in the past. But um, yeah, and azathioprine is kind of the classic, but. And then for how, much, how many months should we wait after low dose rituximab, three months or? Yeah, I, so I, everybody, because my patient, when I was reaching out to the adults, I was kind of in crisis mode. She came to me and was like, so I'm going to start getting, trying to get pregnant. And I was like, wait, wait. <laughs> I was like, we need to plan for these things. We can't just, uh, um, so in talking, it was almost felt that by the time she tried and then was pregnant for nine months, it would just not even be an issue. So I think if you comfortably wait three months or so, if she's willing to wait, you could try the regular doses of rituximab, that, but then you have to wait six to 12 months, right? So it just depends on what stage of family planning the person is in and how important it is. For my patient, waiting six to 12 months was not really an option in terms of her family planning, so. Thank you, ma'am. So, Dr. Neuner, there was a recently some large meta-analysis uh, on uh, TPOs causing thrombosis or not causing thrombosis. I'm sure you must have come across that. Conclusion was it doesn't increase the risk of thrombosis. Yeah, and and so 
that was the great debate. You know, people were saying this is not this is not truly something we have to worry about. And then there were other people in the room that were saying, well, I'm still cautious. I still don't, you know, they, they were saying, um, you know, particularly in high risk patients, they're really hesitant. Um, I just think that, um, you know, when we study drugs, you know, the, the signal even from the beginning was really hard to know. ITP patients have a fundamental risk of VTE. Older patients have a fundamental risk of VTE. So what was the true signal that TPOs was never really clearly known. Um, so uh, it was interesting. It was David Cooter and Drew Provan and very, very smart ITP people that, that were really um, debating whether or not the TPOs caused thrombosis. So it was kind of interesting. And whether or not they cause patients to go into spontaneous drug-free response as well is debated. So it's good to know even the experts can agree. <laughs> Come to Dr. Arihan, but before that, we'll take up one question, which you just touched upon. Dr. Arun VA wants to know, but after about two years of TPO RA therapy, if you stop it, what percentage of patients will remain in remission? So this is exactly the thing we were just talking about. So there is a growing amount of literature coming out, mostly from the original L thrombopeg studies. I think they're starting to look at it with ramaplastin that of those that responded, maybe about 30% over time were able to come off drug and have what's now described, they were using the word remission, but it was it's more of a drug-free response. So they were able to stay above 30 per, over 30,000 or over 50,000 without drug. This is a hugely debated topic right now because there's no comparator group. People argue maybe those were patients that were gonna go into remission anyway. Um, the, the biology notion is an interesting one, right? Are we increasing the platelet count such that we're increasing antigen exposure and almost like we do with hemophilia inhibitor patients doing this immune tolerance? The biologists get very mad when we use that word and we don't really know how we're using it. I can tell you, I was sitting next to John Semple, who's a purist, and he said, don't use the word <laughs> immune tolerance. But, it, but there might be something. There's also importance to the salicylation of platelets. Um, that there, that the um, platelets, salicylated platelets, healthy salicylated platelets actually affect the immune system. So it may not, not be the antigen increase that's doing it. It may just be that having platelet volume itself, platelet number adjusts the immune system, but we just don't know. But yes, I, I, I do think we will, we will in the next year or so get a lot more data on, on this idea of, of spontaneous response. Thank you. Yes, Arihan, your question. Hello and good evening to all. So uh, my question is regarding, uh, it's kind of a, uh, I'll take some, maybe a minute to explain it. So, uh, so uh, most of the time in ITP, we are talking about bleeding and the platelet counts. But we all know we have our patients that uh, they do, and it's uh, published in fact, that they have this disproportionate QOL symptoms, fatigue, and, uh, uh, and uh, a poor quality of life. So uh, the, the two questions which emanate from this is one, that is it solely related to the uh, uh, inflammatory milieu which these patients have, or is it uh, is it to is it a component of or more of a psychosomatic component because they are having a chronic disease? And is there a way to dissect that out? And uh, second, if if it is related purely to the uh, inflammatory milieu with those symptoms. And so, uh, so should that be also included as our thresholds for starting and uh, stopping therapies? So that's. Yeah, this is, this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I think that, so for me, when I talk to families, I always say, you know, here's how we're going to make a decision about if you need treatment or not. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is bleeding. If you're bleeding, I, it's not really an option, right? I have to treat you. But then we're gonna spend most of the visit talking about your quality of life. What does it look like living with ITP? How do you feel? 
Can you do the things you want to do? Um, if you're on medicine, is the medicine impacting your quality of life in a negative way, right? I mean, I think we also spend time on side effects can fall into that. And then the last thing we'll talk about is the platelet count, um, because to me, it's more the first two. So I, I focus a lot on this. And, and when we looked at second line therapy, at least in a pediatric population, and we asked physicians the reason for starting health related quality of life was a very high reason for treating. And we did fatigue studies. What was really interesting was that even if patients responded to a medicine, it didn't necessarily mean that their fatigue got better. So that always makes me wonder, it may not just all be as simple as this is oh, chronic disease and inflammation, right? Because even if we put them on a medicine that did what it was supposed to for the immune problem or the inflammation problem, they still had that fatigue. So I, I, people are looking at this, people are trying to do some biology studies into fatigue. We're trying to get more patient data. The biggest amount of data that's come out on this is from the IWISH study out of the UK, which was a patient survey. Um, really showing the impact of fatigue and burden on quality of life. Um, but whether or not fatigue is psychosomatic or biologic, it may also be different in different patients. The best model we have for fatigue and chronic disease comes from liver disease, where it is a little bit probably of both. I encourage my patients right now, since there isn't, I, I will treat them. I, I will treat them for fatigue and I will treat them for quality of life. If they, if they're, if they're, if either of those is, is not where it should be, I think that's an adequate reason to, to try treatment. You just always wanna make sure you're picking a treatment that doesn't make either of those worse, right? So taking a patient with fatigue and putting them on chronic steroids that is not gonna let them sleep and gonna give them psychological distress is probably not gonna achieve that goal. Um, but then I also talk to them about, we, I, I spend time on combating fatigue and it's really challenging, but it is this notion of like the best is a feedback loop. And it is a feedback loop of when you feel tired, you have to get up and move around, right? Even though that's the last thing you want to do. So um, a little bit of fatigue training um, is sort of what they've seen works really well um, in other chronic disease models. Because I don't know that our RTP treatments actually fix the fatigue. They, they, not, nothing has shown that they that they do. And a lot of them don't even show that they improve quality of life that much. So when they when it has been studied. So so from what I understand that if if a patient is say in that relatively safe platelet count zone, say 35, 40,000 not bleeding, but uh, he or she has a uh, QOL issues uh, objectively measured uh, with the uh, validated scores, you would tend to uh, offer them treatment. But so, uh, so again, steroids and a lot of them, it's so difficult. Is, uh, yeah. and, uh, so non-pharmacological therapies is what my question a is. A lot of non-pharmacologic therapies. Um, you know, a lot of um, addressing other issues, right? Um, addressing anything psychosocial that you can. Um, no, my question is, sorry, cutting you short. Uh, yeah. Would you start a pharmacological therapy based on yeah. just the... So I have, I have put some of those types of patients. We have done a trial. I usually do a TPO because I feel like it is the least amount of um, potential side effect exposure um, and negative impact on quality of life um, with a trial of seeing if it makes them feel better. I do have some patients that we turn down their TPO dose. The platelet count doesn't change a whole lot, but they just say, I don't feel as good. And we go back up and there may be a, there may be a psychologic loop here, right? Um, I think we also have to be mindful that whenever we're looking at big patient data, there's always the sensitive issue that the patients that are in support groups and that tend to fill out patient surveys are those that are most affected. So there is an inherent bias in the data that we're getting from those that even gravitate towards being part of support groups and filling out surveys, right? But that being said, I think we can't be dismissive of what we see. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Dr. Cindy, for educating us regarding the advances and even informing us the role of MMF and serolimus. We do use MMF. So there is a plethora of drugs now, and there are so many new kits on the block. So what is your ideal second line? Uh, how do you decide? Do you do any investigations apart from the routine things in primary ITP? I'm talking about only primary ITP. How do you decide the sequence of second line, third line? Uh, with uh, TPO receptor agonist, rituximab, and azathioprine, MMF, now uh, all these uh, newer uh, drugs? Yeah, so I um, I kind of always start with a good screen for rheumatologic and immunologic conditions that would be, give me a better driver, right? That would really say, I shouldn't be using just a TPO, right? There's a bigger picture here that needs treatment. Um, the other thing that, that there's been a lot of new discussion about that um, is kind of just in theory form now, but I think hydroxychloroquine and the, and the patients that have a rheumatology picture, so that's a whole different pathway. But again, first step is make sure you're still dealing with just primary ITP. Then I, you know, I'm going to be express my bias and that I do tend to, even after talking to patients and family, I tend to go to a TPO unless there's a financial burden to the family in doing so, right? So I, I do think that's where we have to be cautious with the TPOs. Um, so I do also really spend time making sure that the family isn't gonna incur some huge financial burden. I do discuss rituximab and like rituximab in the adult, the, the AYA female category, which is where rituximab has really had the best results. Although sadly, I think there's a French study that may just come out and say that that's not true. But until now, the data has suggested young adult females do quite well with the rituximab. And I really like rituximab. And there is some data that it maybe works in those patients that seem to have a little signal of rheumatology right? So the ANA is positive, but not quite super positive. Maybe it's the antiphospholipid antibody type patient. Those patients maybe do well. In my patients that look a little more Evans, I, I would favor an MMF, a serolimus, something a little bit more immune system driven. Um, and, or if I really think they're in that kind of brewing primary immune deficiency category. So that's sort of how I've parsed it out. It is going to get way more complicated once all these other drugs are out there. And we really have to be sure when we're designing studies that we are able to do at least comparative effectiveness, right? So that we can tell the patients something. Um, but I sit down, I talk to patients about their goals. And sometimes there's just something that comes to the surface that tells you exactly what drug they need when they just say, I don't want a daily pill, I'm not going to take it. Or what's going to make my ITP go away? I, I'm so sick of living with ITP. And those are the patients that I say, well, we have rituximab, right? Four doses and you're done. And for some patients that, that they're willing to take that risk because of how much they don't want to live with ITP. Right, ma'am. So absolutely. I think we all, almost all of us do the same thing. Once we roll out uh, the rheumatology, uh, rheumatological uh, causes of ITP, we do give TPO receptor agonists. So do you combine uh, TPO receptor agonists uh, primarily with azathioprine or MMF something de novo, or if you if they don't respond, you add something. We most of the times we have seen if they don't respond to l back after a couple of weeks, if you add a small dose of steroid, the response comes. Apart from that, do you add anything? Yeah, it's amazing, right? It's, it's really cool to see that happen. The synergistic effect is just really cool. So I usually will try them on a TPO first, Sometimes if they don't respond to one, I'll actually go to the other one and just make sure. Um, particularly, I've found this with patients on L-thrombopag. Sometimes it's just they're not taking it correctly and, and all the interactions. If I switch them over to Ramaplast and all of a sudden they respond because it's just that weekly sub-Q. So I will, I will tinker with single TPOs first. But then I do like the story and I've done it with mostly for me, it's with MMF, but just a little bit of low dose MMF with the TPO um, has worked really well for some patients. And then I might try to wean them off the TPO, see if they can just be on MMF um, or vice versa, kind of depending on, on how tolerable they find things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ma Thank you, Dr. Ajit. Uh, good evening, ma'am. So uh, for pediatric ITB patient, uh, uh, what are the early indication or what is the rational way 
uh, to initiate TPO, particularly where they are not in chronic phase. Because in reality, in, in non-theoretical world, in practice world, uh, uh, the, all the counseling and all the advice work at some extent. What happens eventually that uh, uh, they keep on doing investigation. One of my patients even bought the CBC machine at, at their home to regularly check the platelet count. It, uh, so, and it was no end to them. What happens in uh, practice that uh, this patient go uh, for the doctor shopping and eventually they will be on two, three drugs, which is not required. So particularly some of the patient whom we definitely don't want to avoid the steroid, particularly in the pediatric population where we are uh, very much worried about the side effects. So what will be the rational way to uh, uh, introduce any of drug, which we have so many uh, in this pediatric population, which has a less side effect, particularly can have a little bit uh, better effect than other like steroids or IVIG because with in acute episode it will help but for when it become a persistent it's very difficult to put patient frequently on steroid or giving IVIG and uh, we have already fed up with the counseling sessions and the parents want to have something if we don't offer someone is going to offer that so what is the rational way to tackle this pediatric population yeah so um, I, um, so first of all, I really don't do a lot of steroids in, in children. I, I will give them a short course, five to seven days, and either that's enough or it does, you know, they either they respond and they kick into remission or they respond and lose the response or they just don't ever respond. But I don't continue long courses of corticosteroids in children. I also really am pretty biased towards IVIG. Um, I do not think IVIG is a very good drug. Um, it clearly works. When there's an emergency and you need to use it, it works. We have shown um, in a multi-center study between ourselves, Boston, uh, CHOP, um, and Baylor College in Texas, that about 30% of our children, we look back rec retrospectively, about 30% of children that got IVIG had to represent to medical care for some side effect from that IVIG and or had a prolonged hospital stay. This is similar to the Tiki trial five children in the IVIG arm had significant side effects. Um, so we, you're absolutely correct. Um, we should not be minimizing the side effects of these drugs. So we are doing a study um, through the um, Pediatric ITP Consortium of North America right now, actually looking at upfront l thrombopag compared to standard of care. Um, because I am fairly quick to just put my pediatric patients on a TPO. Um, I find that for their quality of life, um, it is a much better approach than coming on and off of steroids than getting IVIG with side effects. Um, and I find that that just puts them on what I call the platelet count roller coaster. And the anxiety of those families is so high. You know, they get a drug and then they want to watch the platelet count almost every day to see when it falls again. And it's so anxiety provoking and it's so unfair when I know I have an option with minimal side effects that can just get them a nice stable platelet count until their ITP naturally resolves. Um, again, there's also a lot of children I don't treat unless I have to, but for the kid that I have to treat, so I think it's going to be really nice for us to get this icon data out there. We're looking not just at platelet count, but at the impact on quality of life. We will do a cost analysis, which I think we have to do if we're comparing to corticosteroids and other standards of care. I'm not convinced that it's going to be more expensive than everything that goes into a dose of IVIG. So, so to answer your question specifically, I'm pretty quick to, to even in the newly diagnosed phase, say, let's just get you on a TPO and, and make the misery stop. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Fahima. You are muted. Good evening, Prof. Cindy. It's such an elegant and enriching talk it was. Thank you for that. I have a case to discuss. It's a 15-year-old male child, multiply treated for chronic ITP, came to me around six months back, received all forms of immunosuppression and a dose of protoxima but 100 two years ago. Still persistent platelet counts of less than 20,000 with some wet bleeds as well. So I did a whole clinical exam to rule out secondary ITPs, PERD or PIDDs as well. Even that came out to be negative. So what will be the drug of choice right now for this patient who has received Azoran, Cyclosporin? I've started him on MMF, but uh, it's been three months and we had to see a response. We have tried both the TPO agonists, but in vain. 
he persistently has epistaxis as well and gum bleeds and some petechiae i'm pretty worried because he's also having this fatigability and an impaired quality of life for a teenage school going child so what would be your choice of drug right now so this might actually be a patient i would try on sirolimus um that is that i've had two patients very similar to this that responded quite well to sirolimus i get a little bit reluctant in these patients to try the higher dose of rituximab um I, they're the patients i'm afraid are going to develop the hypogammaglobulinemia we have seen this the hypogam seems to be more common in the patients that have underlying IgA or IgM deficiency, Evans syndrome, or a primary immune deficiency. And even though you've screened him for all of that, it's still, there's something inherently different about his immune system, right? We know it just from how refractory. Definitely. So even I though- I just wanted you to say if I can <laughs> go ahead with Sirolimus, you know, sorry for interrupting. I just wanted this because I, I would he's an otherwise even- healthy child. Yeah. Otherwise I would do sirolimus and or combination, you know, trying to tinker with some degree of a combination of a TPO and, a, and an immunosuppressant. But I, I think that, that sirolimus, this is exactly where I start to integrate sirolimus. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Gopinathan. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thanks for the very elegant talk. Actually, we again have a four-year-old child who is having failure to try recurrent skin infections and sinopulmonary infections as well. We have screened them for globinemia. Along with that, we found a decreased CD8 and B lymphocytes. CD4 cells were okay and NK cells were okay. So we have sent again an NGS for him to find out what kind of PAD that it is. But apparently his bone marrow is showing a megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia. So mostly we see uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia and all kind of these B cell immunodeficiency disorders. So my question is, how common is, is a megakaryocytic thrombocytopenia in primary immunodeficiency? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, it is one of our, you know, the the, the congenital, and, and I apologize if I'm missing part of your question because it was a little, you broke up for a second for me, but um, I, it, it, the congenital omega karyocytics, right, are a different beast. You bring up a good point just to, just to also reiterate to everyone, which is the importance of not only screening for primary immune deficiencies, yeah. but also screening patients to make sure that this isn't a, 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 a missed diagnosis of a congenital thrombocytopenia. And it's amazing. The adults will tell us stories. The adults say this patient came to me having been diagnosed at the age of four with ITP and it turns out they never had ITP. So um, very good point of one, making sure it's congenital, you know, there isn't a congenital. And then I guess the question is in this patient, is this truly an ITP or something driven by the, by the congenital, right? Just the, the absence. So I may have missed something in there and I apologize if I did, but, but I am, I don't know the link between immune deficiency and congenital omega karyocytic. I, I don't know what the data is on that. But very interesting. I have a really good immunologist at my center. I would be happy to look at the patient. Um, I, I'm sure um, Dr. Milner, Dr. Milner used to work at the NIH and I'm so happy he's going to join me now because I take all, I take all my immunology questions to him. Exactly, ma'am. So we are, I mean, we just gave a dose of IV-18. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Dr. Arihant. Okay. We so, apparently gave a replacement dose of IV-18 to the child post which he had a good response in platelets. Almost it uh, jumped. We have some problem with your uh, audio. We'll move to Dr. Arihan's question. So uh, I'm sorry if I had missed the initial, uh, say five minutes of your lecture, but I don't know if we have talked about it. So uh, I'll start with the uh, this patient experience, which I had like two days back in the clinic. So this a uh, 22-year-old girl, steroid refractory, splenectomy refractory, 
uh, ITP uh, already uh, tried uh, multiple lines, MMF, Dapson. So, and her predominant symptom was kind of menorrhagia. So, uh, uh, and I must admit that a lot of times we do tend to use androgens. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this girl had this back acne. She was on a low dose of steroid as well. And uh, the, the mother and the girl comes back to me uh, crying that uh, she refuses to go to her brother's marriage just because she's distressed about this acne. And uh, I ask her to see the dermatologist and they, uh, uh, they, they write isotretinoin and, uh, uh, and they ask me if it is safe for her. So uh, uh, I do tell her that, yeah, uh, because we know that Atra... Uh, is, is kind of there are studies to uh, say that that atra works in ITP so all transretinoic acid. So my question, <laughs> so my question is uh, your take on atra uh, in ITP and uh, androgen in ITP. Yeah, so the ATRA question is a good one. There's been some abstracts, um, not a whole lot of finalized papers and data. Um, so it really hasn't gained much traction. Um, and when we've looked at right now, we're in the process of discussing if we need to update the 2019 guidelines. And I can tell you the ATRA signal is kind of really faded, um, from the couple of abstracts that were out there. And there has not been a lot of robust follow-up data to ATRA. Um, androgens, I don't have a ton of experience with, you know, my, management approach for menorrhagia is to really focus on one, trying to find the best ITP therapy. If I can't, then um, discussing with my, we have a women and bleeding disorder clinic. So working very closely with the OB colleagues to kind of minimize side effects, but get enough control of bleeding. The other thing you can try is either we don't really have access to amino caproic acid anymore in the States, but transexamic acid um, during the periods even in the absence of platelets, that extra boost can also help as well. Um, so I do rely a lot on um, periodic symptomatic treatment. Um, if a patient does well with less data and it's in a transexamic, it's enough to shorten the duration of the periods and make them tolerable. Because the last thing I want to do is ever put somebody on a therapy that makes the therapy living with the therapy worse than living with the disease. And that almost sounds like the point that we're at, right? I mean, I'm, the therapy is more what she's stressed out about, not necessarily her ITP. So I would maybe redirect on the therapy. Yeah. And one uh, last question. So if you have to uh, implicate few cytokines, uh, what would they be in the pathophysiology of ITP? Oh, there's a lot. IL-18 comes up a lot, IL-2 um, are big ones. Um, those are the signals in ALPS patients as well. Those are the higher markers. We've looked a lot with our immunology team at CXCL9 um, as a marker of kind of immune dysregulation. Um, we are getting ready to do analysis. We have a 700 patient biobank, um, and we're going to be looking at a lot of these cytokine profiles. The problem is that the anti-cytokine drugs are really big drugs. Like they, they have side effects and so, uh, so it's a little, it's a little, you know, even if we find that cytokine signal, it's sort of like, are we, somebody once said, that sounds like, uh, what did they say? They said, oh, that sounds like taking an, an elephant gun to go hunt a mouse. And I said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so we always, again, have to be careful, but yeah, the side of the cytokines, we are seeing cytokine signals. The problem with a lot of the biology data in ITP is that it's not consistently replicated in all patients. And then it also depends on sort of what phase they're in, um, what therapies. And then the other thing that we're lacking that really the biology people would love is like a repository of patients who've had splenectomy to be able to go to the spleen to really understand the biology of ITP. So, you know, if we could build up even not just a biobank of blood samples, but like really a true spleen repository. But anyway, I think there are some cytokines that are going to, that are signals, but again, it's so hard to, to consistently show that every patient is, is, is demonstrating that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Feynman. Hello. 
I, yes, Prof. I just wanted to ask your clinical practice guidelines on how you go about tapering of TPO agonists. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> so there's there's going to be if it's not out yet, it will be. I think there's two different groups that have kind of tried to write some guidance on this for physicians. Yes, yeah, and my. It's interesting because sometimes I try to taper patients and then they get so nervous and they end up wanting to go back. They're like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. We're good. But, um, so I, I just base it on the platelet count and I, and I tell patients, I, I'm more of a chip away. I'm not an abrupt stopper because I just find that for my families, that's very anxiety provoking. So I kind of chip away, you know, a little bit at a time. And then I recheck the platelet count and if they maintain a still, and sometimes I, and I tell families, I say, well, what's going to be our threshold, right? It, does it have to be that it's 150? Probably not. You know, if you can have what, what platelet count can we say you feel good at and gives you the best quality of life and all of that. And that's what we'll sort of use to find our lowest dose. I have one or two patients. It's quite fascinating. If I take away their one mic per kilo, they just completely bottom out. But as long as they're on that one mic per kilo, they do okay. And their platelet count is like 30 or so. So it's that's why I'm just reluctant to just stop abruptly because I have found one or two patients that really hang on to like a very, very low dose of TPO. So I, I'm a, I'm a wiener. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not an abrupt stopper. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, it becomes very difficult for the patients. They get very anxious once the platelet comes from five digit to the four, uh, four digit, or you know, from the six to the five digits. So it's very difficult to explain them that our target is just thirty k. So yeah. that becomes a problem with practice. Thank you. And I usually, I usually set that target before I even start the TPO. You know, I've had that discussion of like, okay, we're going to start this med. What's our target? Um, and I say, I want you to ignore what the, what the company says that I have to target 150 to 400. That's not, we're going to set our own target. Um, and, and so I think then it's, it's at least not a new concept, but you're absolutely right. Even then, if they've had a great platelet count of 90,000 and all of a sudden they're at the 40, they're like, wait a second, you know, now, I, and I'm like, it's okay. But yeah, they come rushing to me with a platelet count of 1.2 lakhs, ma'am. Two weeks ago, it was <laughs> 1.6. Now it's 1.2. It's falling. So it becomes very difficult to convince them. I don't know if it is uh, psychosomatic. They also start to have this feeling of fatigability also along with that. Mm -hmm. I really don't know if they are just feeling it because after seeing the counts or what, but it really hurts and it's no. very difficult to explain them. It's very, I, you know, it's funny. I literally just got an email from a patient the other day. We went from five mics per kilo down to four platelets to count was still about 80,000. And I told mom, this is great. Like it was a follow-up to the dose adjustment. And she emails me and she says, well, he's about to start basketball. His energy is terrible. And I want him yeah. back on the side. Right. And I, I just caved and I said, that that's fine. I mean, there's no harm in him being on five. So, okay. but I know that this is a patient that's going to be very <laughs> off because we right, had five to four, I got an email and I had to go back up. I caved. Yeah. I, like, okay, I want him to I want him to feel good. I want you to feel good. So I, I didn't push it, but we get the same, exactly same conversation you're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Aditi. Ma'am, my question is about refractory ITP, refractory to TPO agonist immunosuppressions, including rituximab. For how long will you wait in an acute ITP to go ahead with splenectomy? So we, there really is good consensus now that splenectomy really should be reserved for at least a year of ITP unless the patient is truly suffering from severe bleeding events. Um, the, the guidelines, the consensus document, um, all kind of really made that push to say, it's gotta be at least a year of ITP. Um, but every patient is different. Um, you know, it depends on what you've exhausted so far, but, um, but yeah, the push is to wait at least a year, if not even longer, but that doesn't mean that we never do it, but. Yeah, because there are one or two patients who will just not respond to anything. And yeah. uh, at three months, four months, we are pushed to the wall to plan splenectomy. And in I such... Will... Oh, sorry. Sorry, yes, go ahead. And ma'am, how do we plan vaccination post-rituximab 
prior and pre-splenectomy? So, so to the latter point, when I before I give rituximab, I typically also start planning the immunizations before I almost treat rituximab like splenectomy, and I get them all geared up with with um, in case they fail and we go to splenectomy, right? Then you're ready. Um, the other point is um, my biggest concern, and I don't know that we have this data, but I think we will get it now that we're not doing splenectomy right away, right? Like we're not just doing upfront splenectomies anymore. At least on the pediatric side, we talk about, and I think the adults maybe have a same sense, but my concern is that the most refractory patients are exactly the ones that are not going to respond to splenectomy. And it terrifies me. You know, if I have this patient that's received everything under the sun and it hasn't worked, I'm so afraid that um, those are exactly the 25% of patients from historical cohorts that did not respond to splenectomy. And now we're just sort of we're, we're selecting for them because we're using more and more drugs before we get to the point of splenectomy. And I think it's potential that our splenectomy success rates are actually gonna go down now that we're self-selecting that 25% that just never responded to anything. So that's my other just general, my general thought and why I am so reluctant in refractory patients to do splenectomy, unless I really have to. I'm just, it's just a general concern, not based on, data. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We are running out of time, but I'll just take one question from the audience, which we are not touched upon. Uh, this is related to all transretinoic acid in chronic ITP. Uh, do you believe that it works? Yeah, so we, we touched on this just a, just a little bit. Um, I have not seen convincing data. All the data has been um, smaller studies, not gone from abstract to publication in some cases, um, very regional. Um, the signal has not been picked up. And, and as I was saying, we just did a ASH kind of lit review to see what's new, what might need to impact the guidelines. And there's very little continuing to come out on ATRA, so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nunet. A very, very long question and session, and you elaborately explained us about all the problems. There are gray areas. They will get sorted out with the research that you, are, you all are doing. And a wonderful day ahead for you, and wonderful dinner, and good night to all the people. Yes. From India. Uh, thank Have you a lovely that. evening. Yeah. We'll bother you with the webinars in future, and maybe invite you personally to be in India again. Would love it. Would love it. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank you as always. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.